Hi, and welcome to another episode of Chrysalis on the Couch with me, Daniel Brown, a tutor for Chrysalis. Uh, today, we're having a really interesting conversation about race and how counselling can help people to process their experiences um, of prejudice and discrimination. So before we get going with the conversation and I introduce the guests for today, make sure that if you're watching this on YouTube, press the subscribe button so that you'll get notified whenever a new episode comes out and you can watch all of the other episodes that are available on YouTube as well. But let's introduce today's guest. So I'm joined by Kemba by Martin and also by Mary and what I'd like to do is just give you three an opportunity to to introduce yourself so let's go to Kemba first. Well hi everybody I am Kemba Eames Green I am a qualified hypnotherapist and EFT practitioner I am finishing up my year two training with Chrysalis and heading into um, placement next year a little bit about myself, I am a serial traveller. I like to live in other people's countries. So I think that gives a really good um, sort of understanding of what it means to be me in different cultural settings. So hopefully I can add something to this conversation. Fantastic. Thank you, Kemba. And Martin, hello. Hi, um, I'm Martin. I'm one of the tutors at Chrysalis. I work on the year one, two and three years. And um, I'm here today because I've got a bit of a passion for social justice issues, um, but race also in particular. I used to live overseas in a number of countries. So I've experienced some of my own kind of like social injustice there. Um, but also as a gay man, you, I've, I've experienced prejudice too in that area. But um, I'm just here really to share my experience, not just as a, as a person who's experienced those issues personally, but also as a... Um, a therapist who works in private practice where I've worked with a number of clients um, with race, trends and um, LGBT issues. So that's a little bit about me. Great, fantastic. Thank you, Martin. And Mary, welcome. Hi, everyone. So I'm studying in Edinburgh and I'm in the third year. I'm halfway there. So um, really the point of being here is um, Yes, I think uh, everyone has got their own opinions and their own experiences about social injustice, system, it? no matter where we come from, uh, we, all, we can always experience that. And I think that is uh, yeah, something important to talk about and really just uh, to share my own personal experience, personal, just from my own point of view and not, uh, um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Mary and Martin and, and Kemba again. So let's kind of pick up on, on where you were there, Mary. Um, you know, you're, you're mentioning, you know, you are going to be talking about your own experiences and, and that lived experience is such mm. an, an important thing. Um, so I guess my kind of first question is, ha has anyone here experienced prejudice or discrimination due to, to your race? Um, you know, how did that manifest and how, how did that make you feel or how did it affect you? Mm. Um, I mean, Mary, are you happy to, to start off? Yeah, well, yes, I guess so. Um, I think, as I said, um, I guess it's important for me not to um, blame, not to go into a place of blame, isn't it? So I, I guess that um, you can always experience that, even I, I have experienced that even in my own country. <laughs> so, because um, sometimes you can experience that even com coming from people that are from a different background. So, um, yeah, I think in my case in particular, I think in my own country, I can speak from that for a start. It. Mm -hmm. um, it's got to do a lot with money. Mm -hmm. So it depends how much money you will be able to reflect that you have then uh, other people will treat you differently. And traditionally, just as it is in other places and in other cultures, um, some people from other different backgrounds will, have, will be more prone to get a stronger uh, diagnose, for example, if they're seeking therapy. So if you come from a really poor background, then you will be most likely be diagnosed with a really strong diagnosis. Well, what would you will call a strong diagnose, other than if you come from a very from a bit of a more wealthy background, you will get a, a softer diagnosis, isn't it? So um, 
Yeah, I think that can happen. And I just as Kemba, I have traveled and I have lived in several countries too. And I think that also makes you sort of shift your ideas about how people, and you realize your own too, because mm. they were also very prone to that, isn't it? To, mm. um, get, to get people into boxes really quickly. Mm. <laughs> And that's when things get mixed up, isn't it? When you get people into boxes and then it's, uh, it's difficult to shift that uh, point of view that you have about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mary. And, and, and Kemba, that's good to you. Yeah, I think, I, I'm not I sure think, if I was very clear, but. <laughs> right. I think uh, one of my first experiences, I was actually sort of thinking about it today. I was 21 when I left. The West Indies, and I moved to Thailand. And um, I think, you know, Black people aren't in the majority at all in Asia. Quite, quite a few, but not not very many. Um, and they generally think if you speak English, you're American, so you're fine, basically. But I had gone to a coffee morning once, and it was at a dermatologist's office. So bear with me. Um, that's what we did. We went to coffee mornings and I remember one of the girls after explaining some procedures, she said, she came up to me and she said, would you like to have a skin lightening treatment? And I was like, what? Um, no, I'm okay, thank you. But her reaction to me being okay with being brown was more jarring, I think, than the question that she'd asked me. So then I... I, you know, she sort of, I sort of dismissed it and, you know, I was like, oh, no, I'm fine with my skin and, and she left. But then I turned around and I said to one of my other friends, I said, um, do you believe what she just asked me? Mind you, I am literally the only black person in the group. And my mm. friend turned around and said to me, um, oh, I think she meant that was for everybody. So I said, well, why would she ask white people to lighten their skins any light? I don't think that question was actually meant for, for anybody else but me. Um, but I felt at the time so dismissed that it must have been something I was missing rather than actually this person quite clearly should not have asked me a question like that. And instead of feeling supported, I just felt like I was made to feel as though the issue was with me rather than the question. I think that was one of my first experiences of feeling like um, an other, you know, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Kemba. And yeah, you mentioned the word other then. It certainly sounds very othering, uh, you know, <laughs> the reaction of the other people around you when yeah. clearly you, you know what you were experiencing. Yeah. 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 Um, Ma Martin, can we go to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I lived overseas for quite a number of years and um, I, I remember an instant just walking down the street and being spat at by one of the uh, locals and being told to go back to my own country. And um, it was something that Mary said um, earlier that kind of like resonated with me because um, I, think, I think in that country in particular, there was a lot of animosity towards white people because I think of the inequalities of um, wealth and there was no doubt about it that if you worked overseas as a white person, you know, you were you did get more money than, than local staff doing the same job. And I think that sets up its own prejudices and inequalities. And, and I remember at the time I, I really was not. I didn't feel angry or upset about it. I mean, I was only in my early 20s at the time working out there as a teacher. But I think what happened, you know, in, in the years that followed, that was a kind of like just a complete understanding of it. You know, the, the British went over to this country and exploited it terribly and, and exploited the, um, the, the local people and their resources and, mm. and, and drained the country of its resources. And even when I worked in um, New Zealand, um, I, I, I was very much aware of the resentment and animosity towards the white British for what they'd done to the land and taken the land away from the indigenous people. And I think, I think for a white person, you know, it's not, it's not about condoning racism or prejudice at all, but, but for me, it was just a process of understanding the anger and the resentment mm -hmm. from the other person's 
perspective. But um, yeah, it's it it's an interesting it's an interesting experience at the time. But I think I think it casts a lot of um, empathy and congruence when I work with clients who've been prejudiced towards and, and racially abused. Um, but it is it's it's a very humbling mm. process is to be on the receiving end of that kind of prejudice because. I don't know why I wasn't angry. I just wanted to understand, and I, and I could feel that understanding and compassion. And that's that's just my personal experience, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So so trying to understand why you were receiving that re reaction. Yeah. You know what what had those people been through? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So my my experiences uh, of kind of prejudice discrimination ra racial abuse um it is quite an interesting one i mean i i am mixed race my mum is black and my, my dad is white um but most people just as assume that i am white it's only mm. really when my hair grows out which i'm trying to let it grow out at the moment <laughs> and it becomes a bit of a, a throw going on yeah um, that people think i might not be um so some people say that i am white passing i, I really don't like that term mm. though, unless no, very no, american but, yeah, yeah yeah i find it quite problematic um but certainly i remember at school um some days my mum would pick me up some days my dad would pick me up and then the other kids would be like what are you are you black or are you white do you what mm -hmm. are you do you even know are you a mongrel mm -hmm. this, this kind of stuff mm -hmm. um but more recently in my my adulthood um so actually for, for a time I kind of skipped past a whole bit there. Um, for a time, I almost denied the the black part of me because it mm. was always considered as being bad, being negative, mm -hmm. not as um, superior as being white is. But as an adult, I've embraced it much, much more. And I'm now kind of proudly mixed race. Mm. Um, but what I found I've encountered is people saying, oh, but you don't look it. You don't look mixed race and i think what mm. how, how am i supposed to look <laughs> um how am i supposed to behave yeah. you know, should my skin yeah. be darker should my afro be bigger should mm. i speak in patois you know, you mm. know how should i be mm. um so those kind of things really really bother me actually and i'm quite mm. um forward when it comes to correcting people and letting them know actually you shouldn't be saying things like this mm -hmm. um, and just having that dialogue with them you know and the hope that they kind of open their, their minds a bit and they're changing yeah. some of their attitudes and, and their views um but also i think a lot of the time people don't realize that what they're saying isn't okay so yeah. it is about that dialogue and, and that education um, I mean, Ma Martin, I'm keen to come back to you, actually. You're saying that, you know, when you're working in the, in the therapy room um, with people who have experienced uh, racism, perhaps colorism, uh, prejudice, discrimination, you know, whatever it, it may be, you know, how, in your experience, does that tend to present, if, if there is a, indeed a typical way, um, mm. and how, how do you go about your work with people who have had those experiences? I think I think for me it's that it's just that it's just those key core conditions that we provide as therapists. You know the mm. um, congruence, the unconditional positive regard, and the empathy, mm. and just allow somebody just to speak their lived experience and just describe yeah. what they've been through. Because a, a lot of people find that they don't feel comfortable talking about it. You know, in in their families or or in their workplaces, and and I think it is it's. It's talking about all those feelings that you've just mm. that, that we've all talked about and and that is the confusion of what do i say how do i react to this what can i if, if i react to it in this particular way what will be the consequences mm. because some people when you raise racial issues is that you that there's going to be a massive kind of like reaction a negative reaction towards you for doing that for standing up for yourself mm. and i think you know it's it's kind of like but for clients, it's about talking possible um, kind of like trajectories that they could go down in terms of expressing their, their ideas, their reactions, their hurts, their pain, mm -hmm. the prejudice, and, and talking through how they're going to communicate that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes it's about um, 
just just listening to the story of, of the actual incidents and the experiences themselves and just and just clarifying and summarizing all of that for them because sometimes they turn around and say well no one's really listened to me like that before in a completely kind of like you know compassionate way because because sometimes as a white therapist is that when things like this arise sometimes you get the white guilt mm. and then i think sometimes that's an important aspect to be able to talk about with with somebody else who, who's not who's not white and that it, it, it might be black or asian and i think mm. it is it's just about listening to their story and, and talking about those themes and issues that most of the time people don't talk about because of the guilt mm. and, and i think it's just being really honest and open about it i, I hope does that give you some kind of like clarity on that maybe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I yeah think, sorry Go on, well, i was just i was just gonna just add on to what martin was saying i think um an experience that i had like i lived in the u.s texas actually for three years and um i've become hyper vigilant right every time i got into my car i knew where my handbag was i knew where my phone was I had a panic button on my car that would start recording anything that was happening. Um, I knew where the insurance was. I, if you ask me now, I literally can't tell you where the insurance is in this car in the, U, in the UK. But when I lived in Texas, I knew where everything was. And I became hyper vigilant because that's the only way that I could process surviving. When I came back to the UK, it's almost as though I had to have a detox of being so hyper vigilant all the time. And it's anxiety inducing. And I think sometimes people might turn up in your therapy room presenting with anxiety. And as therapists, we need to know the backstory as to where this might have come from. This isn't internal anxiety. This isn't anything going on inside of me, but it's a situation that I was living in for such a long time that my processes became different. I started I, I was rewired and I had to unlearn what I learned to survive in that country. And I, and I think about probably younger black people, brown people living in inner cities and things like that, where probably they're not experiencing um, being searched or constantly stopped, but members of their community are. And that creates a level of hypervigilance as well. So they come into the, the therapy room presenting with anxiety and stress and things like that. And you're like, well, you know, I've gone through all the steps here, but there's something else that's that's causing it. And if you look back, they go back into those very set communities after the therapy session is finished. You know what I mean? So where does it stop? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we really need to take a look at when people come into the therapy room. Like, you know, I understand that these stresses can be internal. A lot of it mm -hmm. is, you know, anxiety, but a lot of it is external and environmental. Yeah, yeah. And Mary? Yes, I think what you're saying can be so interesting. It's something really interesting, really, because then um, sometimes, um, Yes, sometimes they, we focus so much on, on clients and then sometimes really the problem is the a system that is around either right. about the families of people or even uh, I was reading on my placement uh, just on Monday this article on therapy today and it was talking about intergenerational trauma and about how it can roll out from one family to others through the ancestors and then uh, there are people that will come that might come to the counseling room and then there are clients and they're having anxiety and they don't know where they come from or they have sadness and they don't know where it comes from and there's really lots of evidence right now a lot of evidence supporting that it might come from the grandparents especially in the u.s they're doing yeah. these studies about yeah. um, especially uh, people that have been through you know they can, they, generations and generations of being discriminated yeah and then right now even if you haven't perhaps been personally discriminated mm -hmm. you're still experiencing those effects on your body yeah. because it will get yeah. a storage in your body yeah. yeah 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 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and I, I think you know kind of what i'm picking up is that 
that that individual approach is so important and you know yeah. just because someone is presenting with anxiety and maybe just because they've um, experienced racism or prejudice it doesn't mean that experience is the same for every person right. so yeah it is important to find out the backstory and what's contributed to it what external factors are there what's yeah. their environment like and the people around them um, oh, yeah. and not making any assumptions you know yeah. and thinking okay I've I've seen clients who have experienced racism before so they must be feeling this this and this and being through mm -hmm. this, this and this and obviously mm -hmm. that, that's not the case mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the really important thing there that Mary was saying really resonated with my experience in New Zealand because when I was talking to my Maori friends about um, racism um, it's, it's completely inter it's, it's completely intergenerational because mm. because the younger people even though they don't live in such a racist society as their pre as their ancestors did and we, we're not talking long long ago we're talking about their parents and their grandparents who were kind of like ripped away from their families by by the white ruling classes and then were put into um, foster homes and adoption homes and and it was it was kind of like a real hard, a really harsh kind of like cultural policy of, of, of separating children from their families. And the older generations talk about that with the younger generations. So the younger generations are still kind of thinking, are they still living in this racially um, unjust society? And mm. in, a, in a lot of ways, they're not. But in a lot of ways, there's been a lot of um, unresolved resentments and unresolved legal issues and land issues and that the government was going through to, to address but obviously countries like um, Australia and America that they're not they're not putting through the policies on on kind of like um, addressing resentment and yeah. injustice and and, and 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 kind of like creating that equality again um, New Zealand, I think, is a very unique country where a lot of those resentments were being heard and working through the courts. But I think um, the, the intergenerational issue is very strong, I think, for, for racial um, mm. injustice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so thinking about, you know, the, the experiences that you, you have had and, you know, you've all, all shared and I've shared as well. Is this, if you're happy to share again, yeah. is this something that you have ever discussed in counselling? Um, and if so, has that been helpful or, or not? I think I've brought up um, some issues, like I had a therapist um, in the U.S., but I think she got me on many levels, but not that. I think there are cultural nuances um, that are just that, cultural nuances, um, that if somebody doesn't get it, they just don't get it, you know? Um, and I think sometimes in a rush to try and understand, we're not listening. As therapists, that can happen. And that's what I felt. In, in in such a plea to sort of yeah I get you I understand I can I can see I don't I don't think she was actually listening to me and I think going back to what Martin was saying a, a, a bit earlier is that that listening people just want you to sometimes listen to their story hear me see me you know I'm here and this is what it is rather than you needing somebody to say yes I understand but do you <laughs> do you really you know, um, I think that's a question I ask, and I, I, I ask a lot of people, and I think sometimes that sort of puts people a little bit on the back foot. When I, Do you really, you know? Um, but I think even for myself as um, somebody that have had clients in and out, you know, when people come with something that they're presenting with, I, I ask that question of myself. Do I actually really understand what their lived experience is? You know, am I looking at this from their perspective or my perspective? Um, and yeah, I think it's important for that self-reflection even in that moment when somebody is speaking, like, am I, am I actually listening to you from your viewpoint, from your standpoint? I think that's really, really important to capture. 
Yeah, de definitely. You know, a active listening is obviously a key ingredient, um, you know, in, the, in that therapeutic relationship, but also being a reflective practitioner. Yeah. Um, and, and as you say, really reflecting on whether we do understand what the client is bringing to therapy um, and recognizing when we don't. Yeah. And knowing that it's OK to go away and do some research, it's OK to ask questions, but also sometimes it's in the client's best interest to say, actually, I don't think I'm the right therapist for you, but mm -hmm. here's someone fantastic I can refer you to, you know, who, who might get it. I, I also no, yeah. think, sorry, I don't know if I interrupted you there, but I also think that's something uh, that is really important. I have only, I have some therapists in my life, but then um, two of them have, haven't been from my country. And one of them, um, when I was talking about things in general, it wasn't even me bringing something racial, it was just life in general. Uh, but of course, because it's, it, it's related to everything that I am, so it will also bring aspects of everything. So she used to ask uh, a lot of things. So our sessions at some point, especially at the beginning, and I understand that it's part of the process at the beginning of, of getting to know each other, but it was really centered about her trying me saying uh, aspects about my life and my country. And that was really not very nice. <laughs> I didn't yeah. experience that, that, like a very nice like client experience. Mm. So I think that um, if you are a counselor, you really need to, and if you had a client, say from, I don't know, from like me, I'm from Venezuela, from Venezuela, you really need to do your work and go and yeah. research about that country. And mm. I don't really need to be there using my yeah. time of yeah. therapy, uh, explaining about my country, because other, it kind of feels like it's just out of curiosity. Mm. Kind of feels like it's just me saying facts and, you know, mm -hmm. Mary, the National Geographic channel here <laughs> explaining what, <laughs> you know. So, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to like bash or no. say anything about no, the no. therapist. No. Uh, she, she's a good therapist, but mm. it's just that really those sessions were really out of focus in that sense. Right, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I get that. I get that a lot because I'm from Trinidad and Tobago which is next door to Venezuela and we get the same sort of questions you know people people are genuinely you know wanting to know but that is not what you're in therapy for it's not a geography lesson I get it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah 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 uh, Martin how about you do you have any uh, you know experiences of talking about this kind of thing in therapy yeah i think i think one of the really hard things to talk about with racial injustice is is the um is the experience of microaggression and covert racism and and it's a real it's a really tricky issue to talk about because there, there doesn't seem to be a kind of like an end point to it or a kind of a solution to it it's almost like the whole subject is surrounded with with its own internal gaslighting kind of thing and it is it's kind of like you know when you know when you feel uncomfortable with somebody because they're making an assumption or judgment or projection onto you but you can't quite but and it's, it's a bit like the elephant in the room isn't it with somebody and some people feel like that in their workplaces that even though people don't say it there's the definite prejudice there and because they don't say it, the aggression can come out in a very covert microaggression way, but there's no way of really proving it. Mm. And there's real no, and, and, and it's very difficult to confront it with, with work colleagues or, mm. or, or even family members, because, because it, it, even, even racial racism can be internally projected within the families themselves. Mm. And, and that you can build, you can end up with like hierarchies within the family. And, mm. and I remember some of my Maori friends were saying this is because society considers particular groups of people to be inferior or inadequate or mm. an embarrassment because they remind the dominant class of their guilt, for example. And then, you know, you start to think there's something wrong with you. And I think I, I noticed this with, through homophobia and internalized homophobia. Racism, I think, is on a similar wavelength is where you start to internalize that there's something wrong with you. Mm. And, and then you come to realization that actually there's nothing wrong with me. There's something wrong with society's perception of me. Mm. 
And I think that that's a really wonderful experience to come to in, in, in the therapeutic process, because then you can see the client realize, well, actually, it's, it's not me. Yeah. It, it's, it's the way society or people, certain individuals within society that perceives me as being inadequate when I'm not. And, and I think that that can create a wonderful kind of like upsurge of energy and life force and purpose mm -hmm. to actually go out in the world and say, no, I'm going to go out in the world and make my mark and I'm going to help others and I'm going to learn to become a counsellor or a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer. And then they channel that frustration into a really creative kind of like profession where they can actually exert some positive force within society again. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's a lot of negative stuff to talk about, but there's a huge amount of positive potential with any social injustice issues that it can be turned around. And, and there's, a, there's something within all of us, a buried treasure, I think, where we can find a strength to go and work on behalf of other people and, and stand up for other people and, and you know, make, make a difference, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so to, what we've been talking about, I've been kind of thinking about my own, own experiences of, of talking about stuff in, in counselling. And um, I've spoken a little bit about some of the, the racial stuff I've experienced, but it's been mainly to do with homophobia. I'm gay as well. Um, and I think it's so important that therapists do have uh, some level of understanding of what that might look like for different forms of it because you know as martin you were just saying you know that kind of covert um microaggression stuff is so common but i think most people think about all that really overt racism or overt homophobia whatever kind of hate it may be you know the name calling the physical stuff but then there's this whole other level beneath that but so difficult as you say to um to prove to do something about mm. um but actually when you experience it time and time again it's exhausting uh for, mm. for many people um mm. and difficult to know what what you know what do you do about it how do you challenge that in the workplace how do you challenge that in communities or in your families without there being some kind of fallout from that i guess but actually being able to process it in therapy is such an important thing. And as I say, that's why some level of awareness is so important um, in, in, therapists, in therapy. And, um, you know, the client's not having to do all the work for the therapist as well, I, I think, which kind of comes yeah. back to what you were saying earlier, um, Mary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Following on for, from Matt, then, I mean, what what do you think the kind of one of the solutions to this might be in terms of therapists being able to really help clients to uh, process their experiences? You know, what what what's needed, do you think? Mm. I think um, it I think both sort of people that are the recipients of and people that sort of give in, you know, want of a better word. I think there's a language, like a linguistic dance that I think therapists have, have to do in order to not elicit shame and guilt um, within their clients, either side of the spectrum, you know. I think, it's important for therapists to be mindful of the language used. And I'd give you a little um, a reason why I'm saying that. Like, there's somebody I know that has been doing a lot of reading and a lot of work around um, sort of people, ethnic minorities and, and things like that. And the, the conversation is happening and they said, oh yeah, you know, it's just so sad. These people are poor and they're black. And I went, on what <laughs> you know um and they were just trying to make the point that you know there were two things going against them but I think it's very important not to put those two things like this you know what I mean it's not the same thing 
um, yes, they're poor and they happen to be black or they, they're black and they happen to be poor. But I think there's, a, there's, there's that sort of conversation that people have where it's always, oh, the minorities and da, 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 da. I think being a minority is separate to your socioeconomic situation. Now, it may be a contributing factor, but it's separate. And I think is this sort of linguistic dance again that we need to be aware of where people can take things away and internalize it even from us as therapists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, some really good points there. You know, one thing does not equate to the other. Yeah. 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 And and language is important. And and also body language, would you say as well? Mm -hmm. You know, not just what they're yeah. saying, but you know, their reactions, you know, how, how they're presenting them themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but Mary, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, well, I think um as a general rule, <laughs> not even only in the counseling room, but in general, what I have a uh, notice with people from other cultural backgrounds is that clarifying is really important yeah. because um, even um, even more so when you're with someone that comes from a different place it's always important but it's even mm -hmm. more important when it's someone from a different place because you can very easily assume something that is not and then sometimes you can even assume things from very small things as you were mm -hmm. saying even like language of uh, or something really small, like the way you move or the way that you present yourself, the way you dress, it can easily mean something different to um, different people. Mm -hmm. Like I speak very loudly and then um, because it's my culture, it's, I cannot mm -hmm. avoid it. <laughs> and I'm very, you know, like out there, but I'm actually not very, that's not really my personal. <laughs> it's just the um, sort of the way that we conduct ourselves. It's sort of almost like a custom that we do. Yeah. And then I remember, and, and this is a bit of a personal experience outside of the counseling. So um, I have this friend here, and she's been my friend for uh, seven years that I've been here, seven and a half. And her husband is British. Mm -hmm. And then we were having dinner, and then I was telling a story about something that I was struggling with. And he said, well, Mary, I'm very surprised that you're struggling with, with something like this, being that you're kind of a really aggressive person. Ooh. And I said, my friend, she's from a South American country, too, and she was like, what? <laughs> what are you saying? And he was like, yes, because you're very, you know, like out there, like very, you know, in control. And, and, and she was, we were both shocked because I'm actually not like that at all. That's like the, like the last thing that I will say about me. And I think my friend too. But um, that's the way that he perceives that, just because of the way that I move and the way that mm. I speak, because I speak loudly or because I um, move my hands a lot. Or I don't right. know. I don't know exactly where he gets it from. Mm -hmm. Maybe he mm -hmm. doesn't even know himself. But um, yeah, I think clarifying is very important mm -hmm. because um, yeah, and, and even very very deep um, subjects like family the way mm. that we conduct ourselves about family, the mm. closeness that we have with friends or not mm. friends, and how close, um, for example, like my, my political family, like my sister-in-law, or even distant family have really got an impact on me. Mm -hmm, Whereas mm -hmm. in other societies, it's not the same. In other cultures, right. it's not the same. So um, yes, just assuming, sometimes we assume really um, basic things. Mm. But we kind of like it's not no it's no one's fault we all do it right. it's i do it too probably and but it's um to do the exercise to clarify so yeah. that i seem to be going in circles can i ask you a question mary Is yeah that okay that's, to ask mary a question? It's okay. i i i am really interested to understand how you felt in that at that moment when you were labeled sort of a what aggressive or angry? yes yeah. No, he said aggressive. Aggressive, but yeah. I think, like, I, I think he meant more like I was very, um, I don't know how to say it, very um, assertive or yes, assertive or extroverted. Perhaps I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that, I, I rather think that's what he meant. But yeah. <laughs> but that sort of like um, in that moment, my friend, what she was, I mm. didn't think. 
<laughs> so mm-hmm. it was mainly centered about them both. Right, she was right, she was right. talking about me. So I think that I felt mm. um it's a bit disappointed. Mm. It's it's disappointing actually mm-hmm. to be, if I may say so, and if I may, it's really disappointing to mm. um, find yourself being perceived in a way that is actually like for me aggressive is almost an insult. Right. Right. So being called mm-hmm. that way for me was really it's, it's mm-hmm. difficult. Yeah. And especially yeah. when I don't I don't identify at all with that. Right. Right. So and then I just start self-doubting yourself, like mm-hmm. it's not really how everyone perceives it. Maybe mm-hmm. and because we're cancelled or mm-hmm. you are you know just very self-aware. So you start doubting yourself like maybe this is in my Johari window some way <laughs> and I have lost it and I'm an aggressive person and I don't know. <laughs> you, know you start doubting yourself like maybe I am mm. aggressive. Mm-hmm. So um yeah I think that it makes you go at, at least me it makes Into me go them. yeah, yeah mm-hmm. very inside me and start doubting mm-hmm. things that maybe I have never doubted. So yeah yeah and I, I, yeah. I, I I'm asking because I've been labeled aggressive many times. <laughs> yeah. um, when I'm like literally just trying to say something, you're aggressive and I I could I I get you. You know, I get where Thank you're coming you. from. And I and I, I get where, you, you know, the way that you can then question, 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 and then internalize. You know, it must have been the way I said it. It must have been mm-hmm. my manner. It must have, no, it wasn't. It was him. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think I, I, uh, sometimes it's quite um, sorry to interrupt you, Daniel. It's also, fine. but I think it's in, it's important for me to say this. I think it's also very sad because he's my friend mm-hmm. and he's been my friend for seven years. And for yeah. seven years, perhaps he's been thinking that I'm I, that I am aggressive. Wow. So it's really um, it's really sad for me too. That's where the disappointment comes mm-hmm. because there is that mismatch and this. Uh, misunderstanding, isn't it? And then mm-hmm. you really start thinking, like, how, where is this relationship actually mm-hmm. based on? Yeah. Like, are we really getting each other? Is right. this really, are, are we really, you know, having some sort of connection or are we just. Right, right. I, I don't mean to go too deep because no, it's no, a no. small conversation. No, no, no. Yeah, it's, um, for me, it's very sad in that way. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I think I think what you're describing is what a lot of people feel like within societies. You know yourself, but then society has an idea of you, um, and you're like, well, no, that that idea doesn't actually match with who I am. But then your broad brush sort of you must be this because of you must be that because of whatever. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Mm-hmm. So no, you're not going on. I think it's a really good really really good point that you made there yeah Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah i I agree with with kemba you know really important uh, points that you've made there and i guess it it kind of ties in with um uh, you know unconscious bias you know some people don't even realize what they're saying and doing um Mm. but then peddling stereotypes as well the angry black woman the angry black man uh, you know which is often not actually the the case. Yeah. So, mm. we're, what we're going to do is sorry, Kemba, mm-hmm. go on. No, I was I was just going to ask Martin, like maybe you've sort of experienced that as well. Like you know, gay men must be fill in the blank. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's there's all of that there. But what was really amazing about what you and um, Mary were talking about. If I can, if I can pull it back to that, I'm not avoiding yeah. the question, Ken, but, <laughs> but one, of the thing, one of the things I noticed is, is where a dominant culture hits a minority culture and where the dominant culture makes assumptions about the minority yeah. culture. Mm. And that's often to do with women, because when I lived yeah. in Brazil and when I lived in um, uh, I- India and Sri Lanka, the, the, the cultures were much more matriarchal. Mm. and where where women were more um, kind of like confident in their families and more assertive and and kind of like extrovert and confident Mm -hmm. and that can be mistaken in another culture as being angry or aggressive or confrontational and I think you know it's kind of like what 
um, Daniel was saying about being mindful of stereotypes and being mindful of kind of like ways people are in the therapy room. It isn't because of their individual personality, it's actually because of their culture and their family and their upbringing mm -hmm. and their traditions. And I think that's what I loved about living in other countries and living in London is that you always, you know, rubbing shoulders against people from different cultures and, you know, you have mm -hmm. amazing conversations with them about their countries. Mm -hmm. But um, I think sometimes, you know, when you hit a kind of like a, a kind of like a resistance, it's hard because it's you do hit prejudice and you do hit a kind of like a brick wall and you do start to think it's you and then you get all the guilt and shame kicking into it and I think mm -hmm. they're really good themes and issues to discuss in the therapy room but mm -hmm. you know you know I've I've experienced it as well you know gay men are effeminate and and puffy and kind of like la -di -da and it's kind of like well no they're not actually you know there's a yeah. big mix of what gay guys are like and the stereotypes are, are, are still out there, um, but it's just it's just nice to be able to talk about it with somebody in the therapy room and with friends and colleagues as well. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for for joining in this this conversation today. I think that some really important points that have been made, and hopefully those watching this will be able to really get some good takeaways from it. Um, so yeah. I'd just like to say thank you to Kemba, to Martin, and to Mary uh, for joining in with this episode of Chrysalis on the Couch. And another reminder: if you're watching this, press the subscribe button and get access to all of those episodes. They're wonderful. There's loads of them. Um, and we'll see you soon for another episode. Bye bye.